Great to see you all. We took a little bit of a, a hiatus in May, so it's, it's fun to be back um, here after a, a month break. Um, I wanted to also welcome all of you who are joining for SF Design Week. Uh, I hope the activities and events that you've been to so far have been inspiring and enriching. Um, we are excited to be part of the SF Design Week um, events, so uh, thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are our regular uh, Design Is um, attendees, you guys all know, um, we started this series a um, couple, almost two and a half years ago now, uh, to create a space for the design community to come together and explore the role of design in crafting the future. Uh, specifically a future we all want to be a part of. Um, and implicit in that is the craft of design. Um, design encompasses more than just what we can see and touch. To create really powerful and meaningful experiences, we need to engage um, a multitude of senses. Um, and sound design has the potential and the power um, to do that. Uh, sound design can enhance the sensory depth of product experiences. Um, it shapes emotion, and it can even transport us into new realms. Um, it's often undervalued and overlooked, which is why I'm so excited to be able to bring the topic to all of you today. Uh, we have Connor O'Sullivan, who is our head of design here at Google. Um, he leads a cross-product effort, which includes um, the most recent launch of our first sound spec, which is really exciting. Um, and I'm very excited to have him here because he is an industry leader in sound design and sensory and sonic branding. So he knows a lot about this stuff. Um, I don't know very much, so I'm really excited to learn. Uh, he is has brought together a group of inspiring experts, and I'm going to let him introduce and be your host for this evening. So uh, please join me in welcoming Connor for Design is Audible. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Kai, for uh, allowing us to talk about sound design uh, as part of SF Design Week, which is really exciting. It's also Pride Week, so I'm very excited about that, too. And um, we're here today to talk about uh, sound design. So let me just jump in here. Um, before I actually introduce some of the uh, uh, talented designers who are going to share some of their work, uh, so get ready to do some listening, um, I just wanted to take a step back and just talk about the value of sound as part of the product design experience. So, you know, as humans, we're constantly experiencing sound. Sound is all around us. And our brains are very good at background listening and deciding when we need to pay attention and when we don't. So as sound designers, uh, we have the opportunity to create soundscapes um, that take advantage of this. And sometimes the sound can be uh, in the background, receding, and other times in the fore, grabbing your attention. And sound has been shown in studies, particularly related to uh, product experience, to impact in the perception of things like quality, emotion, and even time. And increasingly, in product design, we tend to rely on uh, visual modalities to convey a lot of information to users. But sound affords us the opportunity to offset some of the burdens that we place on the visuals onto this other sense. So I recently wrote about some of this in an article um, that addresses some of these topics. And also, as Kai mentioned, announced the first ever uh, material design uh, guidelines for sound design. So we're really excited about that. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, um, please do uh, check it out. So um, going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Elad Marish. And Elad, I've had the pleasure of working with um, on some work that we did for Pixel, which I hope he's going to talk about. And Elad is a senior producer and partner at Swell Music and Sound, which is a cutting edge sound design studio and audio post shop here in San Francisco. So his work spans from national broadcast commercials, HBO, and documentary film to UX and original music composition for bands and brands. So Ilad, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. And I want to apologize for my pathetic slides. 
I'm a sound designer. I have no idea what to do with Keynote or PowerPoint. <laughs> Luckily, I spelled things right. What is effective sound design? Uh, so at Swell Music and Sound, we do a ton of video work. And so I'll divide my talk up into video, or work to picture, as I call it, and then UI experience. Um, so in video, and the two are very different. So let's start with video. So when clients give us a video, they tell us to bring the scene to life. How do we do that, sound-wise, that is? In this particular example, which won some awards, they gave us a blank slate. It was completely silent when they gave it to us. Let's watch. So this was for the photosynthesis pack, whatever that means, for Nike. And then the jungle pack after that, which we did one with butterflies. But like I said before, it was completely silent. So we had to design everything from the jungle background to the laces to the kind of plants growing sounds of the jungle. And then finally, the, the supers or the title cards at the end. So you know what makes for good sound design there? Um, somehow that came together to be a compelling enough piece to win the IACP awards and so forth. Um, so we, we'll talk a little bit uh, more after our presentations about you know, why, what makes that compelling. But for me, it's the, it's, it's the juxtaposition of the background sounds plus what we call the heart effects, which were the shoelaces tying and the plant sounds and so forth, and then the buttoning it up with the Nike sounds at the end. Another thing we think about when sound designing to picture is that, as you guys may know or not know, every video is made up of frames, typically 24 frames per second, sometimes 30 or other weird frame rates, but typically 23, 98, or 24. And in our digital audio workstations, we have the capacity to sound design every single frame if we wanted to, which would take all day. But this particular client had the budget to sit with us almost on every frame of this thing and designed it that way. So think about frames when you think about video, and also enjoy Snoop Dogg. One Sasha, one boss, one word, banks. Beat her, beat seen, like Dolph, like Dean. No guts, no glory, one shot, one story. Beat you, like now, no time, one run. Be like no one. Get the deluxe edition and play four days early. Rated T for teen. Thank you, Snoop. So that's, so that's one of my favorite spots because there's so much going on. There's so many scenes, so many frames. Um, and we were able to, in a frame accurate fashion, sound design every single scene, every single frame with the client. And we sat there for probably 16 hours doing it in the same room with them on the couch. Um, you know, the, the, the wrestler hitting the mat was us doing Foley with, with our leather couch cushion and recording it in real time. Uh, sometimes we draw from our massive sound library and drag sounds in and then design them and mix them so they're perfectly suited to the spot. That, that piece just had Snoop's VO and the music track and we were tasked with making the sound design amazing. Um, so that's, that's every frame. Uh, a little bit about UI. Uh, what makes for effective sound design in UI? That's what we'll be talking about for most of the night. Uh, and I like to think about designing for the brief. So the first phase of that is exploration. We get together with client and we talk about what do we want? Um, you know, what's this going to sound like? So I had the pleasure, as Connor mentioned, of working with him on uh, the Pixel 1 and the ringtones for that. And we had the idea of who's going to be using this phone? Is it going to be, you know, who are the users? So we thought about different subsets of users, like the techie user, the kind of uh, math nerd user, the, the sports head, the emo music person who I identified with. Um, you know, who are, who are our users? And so we blocked it out and we gave letter code names to each user and we tried to design sounds based on those folks. So that was a pretty creative approach. Let's see what we came up with. Exploration phase. I think we call that Borg. 
Techie. Soft, round, a little warm, modern. The next phase is picking one of those things. So we call that the initial direction. The one we picked was that guy. It's really hard to talk about sound. So let's just keep in mind what that sound sounded like. So then we went about revising that sound with our client. Cool, we dug that. It got our attention. Uh, it's soft, uh, appealing, uh, attention grabbing, modern. It, uh, it has a couple of tones embedded in it. And we can get deep into the world of what you know, sound and uh, waveforms and sound waves, but we won't do that right now. But we decided it was a little repetitive. What would happen if we added a musical element to it? Sweet, everyone dug that, and that ended up being the Zen ringtone on Pixel. So that is about all I have time for today. Um, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in a little while. Thanks, Vlad. So next up, we have uh, Kevin Dusseblan. And I uh, found out today that Kevin plays in an Irish music band, which is a fun fact about Kevin. Uh, but he's an award-winning uh, audio experience designer working in San Francisco. Kevin spent the last decade creating content for entertainment and technology with brands like Google, uh, HBO, Nickelodeon, and Ubisoft. So please welcome Kevin. Right. Great. Thanks, Connor. Um, let me start by uh, calling a lot out for stealing my joke, which, to be fair, I stole from someone else. But that is the apology for the slide deck because, again, we're sound designers. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so thanks all for having me and, and spending your evening here talking about sound. Um, specifically, I would like to talk about um, designing audio for the intersection between entertainment and product and UX. So over the course of my career, probably like several designers out here, I've had the opportunity to work across a large spectrum of products and uh, mediums, from film to games, broadcast, over to software, hardware, VR, et cetera. And um, the last several years of my career have sort of pulled me more and more into creating um, voice experiences. So this is uh, content for Google Home, and Amazon Alexa and platforms like that. And my main role nowadays is working at a, a company called Xandra. Um, and we specialize in immersive, rich content for those particular mediums and work with companies like HBO and Google and Amazon and Nickelodeon, Sesame, and others. Um, and what's really interesting is that it represents, as I mentioned, a true intersection between entertainment um, and UX. And I say that because often we're tasked as a company to convey linear storytelling and gaming through sort of a more traditional um, UX environment using things like speech recognition and voice user interfaces. And um, so I'd love to share a few examples of kind of how that plays out in real time over voice experiences. Um, so I'll use a few kind of uh, classic types of UX sound design elements that you might hear in a UX system um, as an example of uh, to convey these particular sounds. So one of those is uh, an orientation sound. So that could be an intro or an outro to a product, really anything that indicates to the user um, where they are in time, structurally or narratively. So here's a quick uh, example from one of our voice experiences. <laughs> Welcome back to Nickelodeon's SpongeBob Challenge! The annual jellyfish migration is sweeping through town, and those jellyfish hunters are sweeping through the Krusty Krab. Let's get behind the register and get to work. So, um, we, yeah, we have a lot of fun. We get to work on really cool IP. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's an example of uh, an orientation sound. And that, like I said, that's an intro to uh, one of the voice experiences and a return intro and specifically. So another uh, category of uh, UX sound design elements that we also borrow, but use in more of an entertainment or gaming fashion would be a call to action. So this is really anything that invites the user to interact with the product. 
Um, so an example from one of our experiences is the following kind of short example. What kind of animal came in seventh in a half marathon in Alabama? Was it a cat, a squirrel, or a dog? Uh, and full disclosure, I don't know the answer. Uh, and then this is a great opportunity to ask the crowd what you think. Uh, so maybe just, you know, after uh, the speech you know, or the, the talks, just come and let me know what you think. Uh, but essentially, uh, you can hear a, a music cue there that we use throughout that experience to indicate that a prompt or a call to action was coming. And then we have a clear question as well, inviting the uh, user to speak. Um, and that kind of leads us into feedback. So feedback is in UX, uh, just a, a sound that the product will emit or potentially would have a visual to indicate that there has been interaction. So here's a couple examples of some feedback. So that's a clear affirmative if we answered that past uh, question correctly. And uh, a clear negative. <laughs> uh, so the last one I'll talk about is kind of another basic uh, you know, standard sound type. And that is a branding sound. So at Xandra, when we're working on voice, we tend to try to weave branding through our experiences as much as possible. Um, but we uh, do get the chance to just play great branding cues. So here's one that we whipped up for one of those actions that I just shared. All right. Uh, so, as I mentioned, working at this intersection provides me some pretty cool opportunities. And the one that I want to talk about mostly tonight with you guys is uh, being able to borrow best practices and principles from both entertainment and UX and kind of realize them in this center space where we work in voice experience. Um, and I think it's kind of worthwhile for the design community to think about this because in some cases, if you're kind of too far over in entertainment or too far over in UX, it's really easy to look over some very core principles. Um, so we spend time at Xandra, and I spend time in my work working with my sound teams, really focusing on a few of the following principles as we go through our practice. Um, so the first is story first. Um, so story, of course, is the words on the page, the picture on the screen, maybe the uh, vision of the director. But I think it's actually a little bit more than that as well. Um, for us, it's the intent of the product. And it's maybe the style or the emotion that's trying to be conveyed in a particular moment. So we try to make sure that we really emphasize the intention and hold that center as our first priority when we're designing. Um, I think this actually mirrors the core principles of UX design as well, which are to provide relevant and contextual information at all times to the user. And it has a further boon. So if we're all focusing on story, um, we have a kind of cross-departmental North Star that we can focus on and have a shared vision to create for, which is kind of crucial to designing a cohesive experience that might be rich in uh, visuals, animation, sound, and other elements. So the next piece uh, that I'd like to talk about is having a strong story, uh, or I'm sorry, a strong style guide. Um, so this one is kind of a common sense one in some circles, and then in others, it doesn't get much attention. And that's why I wanted to mention it, because it is another very important piece um, and really defines the brand, the look and the feel of the product or the user experience that you're working on. Um, this is just another one, just like a uh, story that uh, provides a strong vision for the team to unite around as well. Um, and I'd like to kind of emphasize that this should get a beat as early in the production as you possibly can. Um, so that way you're creating material and content um, that has that shared vision from early on before you get too far down the road. Uh, the next one, this is kind of the most important one for me after a story. So this one is thoughtful editorial. Um, I'm really kind of stealing from some of the best supervisors I've worked with in, in my past um, who really focus on editorial. And in audio terms, um, it's a great opportunity for pacing, for dynamics, branding, and clear communication. So it really shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and then to me, it means just going beyond stock sounds, not just pulling things, but really being um, thoughtful and curating uh, great sounds. Um, and then beyond that, I'd like to talk about kind of a, a few different types of editorial. So there's sort of the macro editorial, which is super important in the sense that it's uh, similar to spotting a, a film script, where you're looking at an entire product and thinking about how sound is used holistically in that product. Um, and essentially, this might mean using silence, or this might mean picking a perf you know, kind of a perfect sound for a particular emotion. Um, and the next is micro, and that is sort of the nit and gritty, curating that exact sound, getting that exact emotion, and hitting that exact story beat. So those are all super important to me, things that we work on a lot. 
Um, the next is mix. So uh, this is usually just kind of a quick thought in the product cycle, but I really think it's worth thinking about putting time in here and paying a lot of attention to mix. Um, so I'm sure everybody here has an idea of mix, but essentially this is where we're leveling all the sound elements. But beyond that, this is sort of the last opportunity for the sound team to tailor the sounds to um, all of the other elements in the project, because often final animation, final visuals, and final uh, flow doesn't really land until the very end. So this is kind of that last step to get things just right. Um, and of course, this is where we get to optimize for platform. There's a big difference between uh, designing elements for a theatrical film or for a Google Home, and this is sort of our chance to think about that. So kind of with all those things in mind, uh, with a little bit of luck, you will be able to create um, a compelling sound moment or compelling story experience. Um, and I'll just share one from our work uh, that we thought came out pretty well and won a few awards. I'm pretty excited about. You're new. Not much of a rant on you. Not that one, Clem. They're here for something else. You must be here to play the game. Well, you came to the right place. It's not easy, but I can tell you want in on it. Do you? So, actually before I go over there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that was uh, an experience we did for Westworld and for some folks that may have kind of recognized the soundscape there. Um, but it really kind of draws on many of the principles that we were talking about here um, and uh, conveys them pretty well, I hope. Um, so the last one I'd like to mention before I go is that dialogue is king. So um, I may seem fairly biased, having my primary my work uh, be in voice, and I'm, I'm holding the microphone now. Um, but there's a true precedent for this, of course, across entertainment. Um, and that's because in film, broadcast, and games, usually dialogue gets kind of the number one spotlight in the mix. And uh, that's because it's a very efficient and effective tool for storytelling, conveying communication, information. Um, and it can be actually the most co cost effective in many cases. And as uh, Connor mentioned, it does offset the visuals um, at times. So um, the last thing I'll mention about dialogue is that it essentially uh, is the most uh, human centric design path as well. So, um, it can inspire empathy and convey emotion just about better than any other uh, asset type. So um, with that, I'll say thank you so much for having me. And um, I will encourage you, if you kind of want to think a, a little bit more about this, in particular if you come from a, a UX or a product background um, and maybe haven't been exposed to entertainment fields just as much, do yourself a favor, take a little homework assignment, and go read Walter Murch. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. So when I first moved to San Francisco, I found out that there was another sound designer by the name of Connor who had an Irish sounding surname. Um, but the difference is he has two N's in his first name. So uh, I'm talking about Connor Moore, who for the last 10 years has been the uh, award-winning audio creative director and lead sound designer of Seymour Sound where he's uh, been designing bespoke sound experiences for brands across the globe. So he's had the pleasure to work with the likes of Google, Uber, Amazon, and Tesla, and has been featured uh, as an interviewee for California Sunday Magazine, NPR's Marketplace, and Communication Arts. So please welcome Connor Moore. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. It's quite the crowd and a good evening. So. Today, I want to talk to you guys about curating our soundscapes, and in particular, looking at this through the lens of audio user experiences. I'm going to start with a little test, see what you guys know about brand audio and audio UX. <clears throat> now, by showing of hands, how many of you guys recognize what brand or product or app those sounds come from? You guys know your stuff. All right. So sound as a medium has this amazing ability to be very effective in short snippets of time. 
That file I just played for you guys was 10 seconds in its entirety, and each sound was only two seconds in length. So as technology is really starting to utilize audio at these multiple touch points um, for our user voice user interfaces, heads up displays, um, connected home, you know, we have a real opportunity here to be very intentional with these designs and very thoughtful with how we're crafting them because we don't want to add to the noise, right? We actually have an opportunity here to make the world potentially quieter. So I'm actually going to start with um, a bit of a unique storytelling that'll teach you a bit more about me. And I'm going to use my family and our house um, as kind of a, a metaphor for how I think of audio user experience design. Because I think we can learn a lot um, from how people communicate within these ecosystems and potentially bring those learnings into how we craft our audio user experiences. So come on a little journey with me. I live in a home in Oakland. I have a wife of four years. I have a two-year-old son, also known as Mr. Messy, as you can tell, and a four-year-old lab. So this is the audio user experience within my home. So I'm going to play some uh, sound recordings of these individuals in the house here so you can get a little sample of what they sound like. Hey, Connor. So that's my wife calling my name from across the room. Dada. This is my son calling my name in the house. <laughs> and my vicious dog, Miles. I think he's calling my name, unsure. He got two syllables, so that's good. So in isolation and moderation, you know, these sounds aren't really going to drive any forms of stress or they're not overly intrusive. But what about... Right, when they're all firing at once, it's going to kind of drive this more stressful environment. And if they happen over and over again for long periods of time, um, it could actually trigger our fight or flight mode. So we as humans, we don't want to experience these moments all the time, right? But unfortunately, you know, our soundscapes around us are a bit chaotic and unpredictable, and we don't have the ability to always just press the mute button on these moments. But we do have this opportunity to be very thoughtful and intentional with designing our user experience designs. So this is what I call considered audio user experiences, right? So you might ask, what does considered design sound like? So I'll show two case studies for you guys today, the first being Sense. Some of you guys might be familiar with this product. Um, it is a sleep tracker and a smart alarm that sits on your nightside table. And it's able to essentially tell you what is waking you up in a given night. So you can better curate your sleeping environment and um, become a more productive person, um, sleep better, and yeah, just overall be a happier person. So what really struck me with this product is that when I was researching with alarms, that's the first thing you experience in your day, right? Just think about that for a second. That has the potential to make a massive impact on your overall mood, right? So I didn't want to create that. It's a very intense sound, right? And what's crazy is you can still buy that alarm, go to Target and buy it right now. And 10 years ago, that was kind of the only option we had. So I wanted to create something obviously unlike that, something that was really bespoke to this product, something that matched the ID, the look and feel, um, what the brand was trying to communicate. So if you guys would close your eyes, I'd like to simulate this sleeping environment here and play some of these examples for you. So you'll notice these evol uh, alarms evolve very gradually. They start very quiet to wake up soft sleepers. And then they grow over time and get louder to wake up heavier sleepers. So it covers a range of users. These also use a lot of silence and space in the compositions. I learned through research that the brain is attracted to new sounds coming into the fold. So it's a way to kind of subliminally wake you up. You'll also notice these all use softer timbred instrumentation and airier textures. So it really supports this lighter waking up experience. Thanks guys, you can open your eyes now. So what makes this experience considerate? Well, as I mentioned, it covers this range of sleepers. I was very intentional about what is it that wakes up light sleepers versus heavier sleepers? And how can we you know, essentially design a system that is not one size fits all? It really speaks to all these different users. Number two, it uses space and silence in the compositions. I wanted to actually utilize space so people could sit there and actually listen to them and maybe stretch right a little bit instead of just jumping out of bed. And they're a holistic, cohesive soundscape. This is really important with product design or any type of branding. You want something that 
ties the entire experience together, right? So I didn't showcase the UI alerts or notifications either, but these all harmonize with one another. So if an alarm comes in and then an alert rides in on top of it, it doesn't bring dissonance into the experience. And lastly, these are very intentionally branded. They build an emotional bond with the user. It's an opportunity for the brand to create something memorable. Because after all, these people are investing their time and money into this product, so you might as well give them something memorable. So the second case study, unfortunately, I'm unable to speak about the brand, but I did get clearance to play some of the tones. And obviously, it is a car. So I created the in-car alerts in UI and notifications. And for any type of app or product experience, when you're creating these alerts and notifications, essentially, you're trying to express and communicate um, a level of priority or a hierarchy of priority. But this is especially true with the car, because some of these moments are life or death. If you think about a forward collision alert, if, you, if you're not able to hear that and respond really quickly, you could very well end up in the back of a car, right? So it's really important that you're able to communicate these things. So simple, I wanted to create alerts and notifications that are communicative and expressive. So for low priority alerts, I use lower pitch. These are more mellow tone. I use softer tack and longer decay. So these tend to be much more elegant. So this is a ringtone. For medium priority alerts, these step up slightly in pitch. They become a little bit more percussive, but they really lean on this idea of using repetition because as seatbelt uh, warnings go off, you guys know that if they don't turn off until you buckle in. So you will hear it eventually. And for high priority alerts, these really shift up in pitch. So these fall in the range of two kilohertz to five kilohertz, which is the most sensitive area of human hearing. These become much more percussive, and they use a rapid fire three note repetition. So this is a forward collision alert. This is something you're going to hear that's really going to grab your attention, and you're going to be able to react. So what makes this experience considerate? Well, it is communicative and expressive. Um, we were very intentional about working with the team at this company and defining what does it mean to be high priority, and how can we work with the pitch range, the timbre of instrumentation, the composition styles to really communicate this priority. Um, again, using space and silence is always important across these experiences, especially in the driver's seat. Um, a driver could be driving and talking to someone and listening to music, so you don't want to clutter that environment. Lastly, they're simple and direct. They're very communicative, and the compositions are very simple to digest. Again, you don't want to um, throw too much information at the driver. You want them to be able to focus on the task at hand. So in closing, I think there's many things that can make up considerate sound design. And obviously, we just looked at um, what this means to me through these two case studies. And I think a lot of those design principles hold a lot of water and can scale across many brand experiences. But ultimately, it's going to come down to what project you're working on. It's going to come down to what's the product you're working on, what's the app, who's the brand, and ultimately, what are you trying to communicate to those people? Um, as many people have mentioned standing up here tonight, we have a real opportunity to shape what the future of our sound experiences sound like. And we have to start from this zoomed out vision, right? This zoomed out vision of what it means to be considerate. Are we spending the time up front to be intentional and thoughtful in crafting these experiences? And ultimately, I think it's just so important that we um, do this so we can set this foundation for considerate audio user experiences. So thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Um, so really interesting uh, sounds and, and uh, principles, approaches, some uh, really outstanding work there that you're showing. And we're just going to step through a couple of questions here, and then we'd love to hear some questions from the audience, too. Um, so. Um, seeing as how we're here as part of uh, San Francisco Design Week, and there's a lot of disciplines um, uh, represented from, from various people, from things like marketing, engineering, UX design, of course. So I wanted to talk about the process for how we engage with people in these various disciplines. Um, how you might approach a sound design project with designers or uh, branding people or engineering. So what would make a good design brief? Uh, and what would that contain as you begin working on a new sound design challenge? 
Um, so I spoke to this uh, a little bit earlier when talking about Pixel, but it's, it's great to talk to the team early on about what, what we're trying to achieve, obviously, and to, to create a language that b both client and, obviously, designers can understand around the parameters of sound. And it comes down to adjectives, kind of like, it's kind of like a music brief in a way when we get a music brief. Is it warm? Is it fuzzy? Is it round? Is it modern? Is it vintage? Antique, new school, old school, high, low, these things that were outlined throughout the talks. Um, and achieving this common language around sound, which is a nonverbal medium, is, I think, paramount to the process and can get us going on our job. Um, and once we understand, we can grab the ball and be the Labrador. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that as well. Um, yeah, the biggest thing is, you know, what is the project um, and what are the project goals, similar to what Alad said. A lot of times what we like to talk about when we talk with our product teams is, you know, what do you anticipate will be the biggest challenge? And essentially, how can we help? Um, in many cases, when we're producing sound, I think this is true for probably many uh, content creators, um, it's sort of a service industry, and we really want to help um, the, the product makers make the best product they can. So getting ahead of where the challenges are in the project and sort of anticipating and thinking of those as the big set pieces over the course of the production. Where do we really want to dig in? Whereas where are the things that we um, may have more familiarity and kind of can get through a little easier and use uh, existing expertise? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a, I think a lot had a lot of great things to say, but I could add that little nugget. How about you, Connor? Yeah, so I think it's dependent also on kind of what project you're working on. If it's UX driven, obviously UX drives kind of what that brief would look like. Um, if we're talking about it from a lot of the bigger brand build out work I do includes all those facets. Um, and when that happens, you know, just getting a comprehensive brief on engineering, giving you the spec, you know, what what can we actually design for? What is the speaker capable of and what's the environment? So understanding that from engineering side, super important. Brand and marketing is typically more the story side. So really understanding what the communication points are is super important. And then the UX side obviously is how, to, how do these things work in actual application? You know, what does the visual system look like and how can we kind of best map sound to that? So, but ultimately it comes down to getting a comprehensive brief that is you know, explicit kind of on all fronts. OK. I yeah. just wanted to add how hard that is, because yeah. again, sound is something we can't talk about. Like I had the CEO of a company tell us that uh, he didn't want it to sound like a dishwasher or a washing machine. What does that mean? Yeah. So they know what they want it not to sound like. But can you come up with any common language of what you do want it to sound like? Uh, I want it to sound elegant. I want it to sound premium. What does that mean? So the, the closer we can get to a common language, you know. And I don't know if I don't mean to derail it, but because you know, going back to the brief idea, you know, often what I do with companies when they have a brief that, well, generally speaking, first stages with a project is all about discovering what that is, right, and working with the client about, you know, potentially doing workshops. Like, okay, you have these adjectives we're trying to design to, but. Or, or just brand attributes, you know, from a visual language. But what do those mean sonically, and kind of creating playlists maybe of sound or music that can really translate those things into sound? Because you, you know, those initial phases are so important because you're really setting this foundation, right, of of what these communications actually mean. So that's a big part of what I do, you know, in those initial phases is kind of workshop based. Yep. Great, and just from my own experience, a lot. Um, once a sound gets tagged as the dishwasher sound, I think that's forever going to be the, dish, the dishwasher sound. <laughs> but um, I, I'd like you to think about and share some things that um, have helped you to get to where you are as influ influential designers in the field. So one of the questions I often get asked is, how do I get started in product sound design or in sound design in general? So what are some things um, that have helped you get to where you are, and what advice would you give someone who wants to start down that path? 
Sure, I can I can go first. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, when I got started in my career, I, I feel like I got very lucky because um, I was able to meet some pretty big design people at some agencies in San Francisco. Um, but this was this was ten years ago, so it was different. Like now, I feel like you can get out of school, and, and there's you know agencies or you know bigger companies that are that are have these kind of organizations you can get work at. But I, I linked in with some. Um, very influential uh, visual designers that kind of pulled me into some experiences, which, quite frankly, at the time, I didn't really know how to do the work, to be honest, because it wasn't really happening at a high level yet. But it was kind of the first part of seeing product and brand sound come to the forefront. And I said yes. You know, I just kind of jumped into the fire and took the opportunity and ran with it. Um, and that really just opened a lot of doors. So I always recommend to people getting started, you know, I'm not a big fan of the fake it till you make it thing, but sometimes you just got to jump in and, and, you know, take take an uh, initiative and, and just just take off and let let it guide you and you'll figure it out in the process, you know. Yeah, um, I'll kind of piggyback on that um, for sur for sure. I think the uh, the biggest piece for me was finding people that inspired me in various communities, entertainment, technology, and just hanging around them um, while I was learning and. Um, you know, while I was hanging around them, my network was growing and opportunities would pop up here and there. And like Connor said, I'm always saying yes, I'm always showing up and I'm kind of building trust with these people. So some of the earliest uh, studios that I started to build a reputation for myself at, I'm pretty sure uh, it was like 50% super annoying that Kevin was always there, but also super comforting that Kevin was always there. Um, I, would, I would be there and, and that, that reliability um, in our profession is, it puts you a cut above the rest right off the bat. So just, you know, be consistent um, and always be learning and building things. So don't wait for other folks, don't wait for opportunities to come your way. Um, if you're really fired up about product or games or film, you know, and you can't find a team that wants to hire you to do sound for it, commission that team, find a way to do it, you know, do it with equity, tell them that you can't pay them now, but the next project will definitely have funding and it probably will. Um, and in the process of kind of generating the steam there, um, you know, you're going to be, again, growing your network, growing your skill set, and growing your reputation. So, uh, yeah, I think just, you know, being proactive, working hard. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, a prominent Hollywood composer once told me when someone asked him how to get into the, into the gig, he said, is there anything else you'd rather do? Anything at all? And there's a little bit of that with audio. Um, it didn't land like I thought it would. But, um, <laughs> but there's something to it because you need to be incredibly passionate and you need to have skin in the game and you need to hustle uh, really, really hard. And you know, if someone emails me once, I won't pay attention, but if someone emails me two or three times, I might pay attention. And if they're really good and they're really persistent and really talented, then I will pay attention. Good, some great advice there. Um, so. You're a part of a group of uh, specialists and uh, boutique agencies that are vital uh, and that often partner with big companies, tech companies and non-tech um, on various design projects. So I'm interested to know what are some things that uh, companies who want to work with you should maybe do differently or what are some things that they should know um, if they're interested in, in uh, partnering with you on a project? Yeah, I'll take this one to start. Um, we very much, like you said, we work with sort of the biggest companies um, out there, um, which, is a, which is a great opportunity. Um, and companies like ours, our boutique companies, um, we're always stoked to join the fold and jump on great IP and get on the cutting edge of tech. Um, but there's a few things that I think the big companies can do better. Um, and the number one thing for me is, um, I want those companies, and this is a tough, it's tough to request here, um, because you know, oftentimes you're working with great people at these companies and they just don't only have so much control and so much power to make change. But what I would love to see is sort of a capacity to grow and learn from the boutiques and the specializations um, and develop some institutional memory for experiences with us. So you know, it's, it's such a bummer for little companies like us for us to put time uh, into long product cycles with, say, a team at a big company, and then work with a slightly different team
team at that same big company and they don't remember anything and they don't know anything about us. So part of it is the ability to learn and part of it is the ability maybe to communicate maybe horizontally. Um, and I think, Connor, you're probably doing great work at Google. Uh, that's evidence of that. But that's sort of that, that horizontal communication pipeline that's on a disciplinary level. So having audio communication through a company or having visual communication through a company. Um, I'm seeing great steps being made in that regard, but I would love to just see it kind of pile in. Yeah, and I would say, you know, these, these companies got to where they are by taking risks on an engineering side or on a development side or, or something to rise above the noise, uh, no pun intended. And I would like to see these companies um, take similar risks when engaging with us. I find that oftentimes at the end of the day, there is either someone at the top that says, here's how it should be, or, um, or you know, the, the sounds end up feeling safe or expected. So I would love to see a little bit more risk taking on, on, the, uh, on the audio side. Yeah, I think, I mean, kind of piggybacking on what Kevin was saying about having this horizontal communication, it's super important. And it kind of goes back to Connor's earlier question about um, the briefs, you know, of, of having that open line of communication between, you know, engineering, design, branding, marketing. Um, it's just super important, you know, for, for projects and this work to be long lasting, um, whether it be for any of those mediums or all of them, um, there really needs to be that open line of communication. Um, and ultimately, you know, the UX should be telling a story which is helping the branding, and the branding can think about how the UX can play into their marketing materials, which is going to build equity, you know, and the engineering is worried about how are they going to sound in this product that is going to influence what you can do in design. So it's all this, you know, it all circles back upon each other. So just that line of communication is so important. And, and similarly, it is getting better. It's getting, getting a lot better. So that's a great thing, but I think it can always, you know, continue to get better. Interesting. So it sounds like some institutional learning, communication, and risk-taking. Um, uh, some, some good lessons there to take away, I think. Um, I'm also interested to hear if you could give uh, an example, a notable example of a product sound design experience that you admire, uh, but you didn't design it yourself. So if you could pick one, what would it be? I can, I can start again. <laughs> um, so uh, are you guys familiar with Jambox? I'm sure you are. Um, but I remember when that product came out, you know, and obviously I didn't work on it, but I imagine the brief was something like, it's a small, portable speaker. It's pretty affordable, um, but it's really powerful and it sounds great. You know, because most speakers of that size are going to sound tinny and not good on a low frequency spectrum, like bass. You know, the low end. Um, but the boot up sound of that product has a very distinct, you know, kind of run from really low pitch up to a low, a high pitch t uh, tone, and it really kind of showcases the power of the speaker. And that's the first moment the user does is they boot it up, obviously. So when I first received it and I turned it on, I was shocked. It has this really nice low frequency content. I was like, wow, like this is a very strong point of communication to the buyer who just bought this that's like, oh wow, this thing does, it is a really powerful speaker and it is portable and it is affordable. So I think that's a really great example of, of good product sound. Cool, yeah, that's a good example. Um, I know what the sound is, and I, and I totally agree. And I'm not sure if it's the same speaker or not, but there's another Bluetooth speaker or a Bluetooth speaker that when it does Bluetooth pairing, I think Mike has the speaker, um, it has kind of like a little kunga, like a doo -doo -doo, and it's oh, super yeah. nice and also full frequency. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it's like a constant reminder that this thing is not a piece of junk. Right. And it's great, <clears throat> and I just feel like for a brand, yeah. that's super valuable. Yeah. Um, and though, it, like here I am not knowing what the brand is, so maybe not so great, but uh, maybe, the, maybe the brand, so the visual side, maybe just the brand should be a little bit bigger. Um, one that uh, actually I picked up very recently, it's a very new product, um, is the Oculus Quest. Um, so I'm one of those super VR hopefuls. I'm like waiting for it to catch. I want it to be great. Um, and I've, you know, played on a lot of headsets. Um, but I have to say that the Quest, as soon as you put it on, um, all of the sounds make sense. They're balanced. Um, there's sort of a sound when you're in setup mode that lets you know persistently. It's like a pad. It's always on, and it lets you know when you're in setup mode, and you kind of have more to do. Um, there's just a lot of thoughtful, intentional sound. And then from the deployment hardware standpoint, it's fantastic as well. So when you put it on, 
you, you hear stereo effectively, but you're not wearing headphones. And it doesn't have a lot of flow, uh, low frequency response initially, um, but you know, it is kind of a small device. But it, it has a great stereo field, and it's very clean. And, um, and in fact, when you do kind of multi-user uh, you know, use with the, with the device, um, dialogue, like other folks' voice, comes, better, comes through better on this device than I've heard it on any pair of headphones to date which to me blows my mind. So yeah, the Oculus Quest, fantastic. Cool. Elad, I'm, I suspect you might be a bit more of a, a skeptic with this question. I'm a bit of a skeptic, but um, so I'm an iPhone user um, because as an audio professional, I have a million Apple products um, and computers and so forth. And I've always used the same ringtone old phone on iPhone, which totally dates you and sounds terrible. Because um, it's one of the only ringtones I could hear on this phone. Um, but in the most recent iteration of the device, the ringtone I was happy to uh, discover after searching through the whole bin, I found one that is tied into the haptics um, in the phone. So it actually matches, the ringtone is matched up with the vibration when it vibrates on the table. And I'm really into that design. The fact that they married sound and haptics together seems like a really obvious idea, but it, they didn't really nail it until this iteration, iteration. So that's my example. Nice. Some multi-sensory design there. Um, so we're going to open it up to everyone. And if you have a question, I believe that Nicole is running around with a microphone. And please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Hello, panel. Thank you so much for uh, this awesome talk. It was really cool hearing a little bit about um, how important a story um, is, as well as like discernible dialogue and uh, the idea of having sounds for states. Um, as a UX designer, I'm super interested in hearing a little bit more about what frameworks we're using uh, to better communicate this vision with design. Um, so are there any frameworks that we're using for sound playback, for example, that provide any transformations or DSP on the sound as it's played back in the app or service? Um, that's super interesting to me. Um, at Subhub, you know, I'm always interested in figuring out how the sound design could get somebody to convert better in, for example, uh, selling or buying a ticket. Uh, but in games, it's like a totally different world where I have things like uh, stereoscopy, I have um, things like delay. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, um, so I have a fair amount of interactive experience. Um, and so, you know, game audio middleware such as WYs um, and FMOD that plug into game engines like Unity and Unreal. Um, those, and WISE I'll pick on in particular, um, is a fantastic product that does do real-time DSP and effects on content. It runs relatively lightweight, and it has just two decades of great engineering. Um, Sony just bought WISE, um, so I'm kind of, you know, I think we're all waiting to see how that product evolves as a result. Um, but it sounds like it's going to survive as a pretty strong um, player in the space, and I'd recommend folks to play with it and, you know, package it with your binaries if you can. Um, you know, they have pretty affordable packages and stuff like that. But I would say that um, one thing, if there are engineers in the audience, um, that I'm always kind of yearning for as a designer is, um, you know, the infrastructure that powers a lot of the experiences that we are trying to bring to market, whether on a phone or whether on a smart speaker, the underlying infrastructure on the code side often does, just doesn't support um, DSP uh, runtime game engines, and or even uh, you know bespoke ones that you might be able to pull on an engineer and, and work with. So um, you know, as much as I would encourage, encourage people to go out and use Wise and tools like it, um, personally, I, I do really want to see uh, engineering work done on the platform and infrastructure sides on on the tech side um, to just support uh, a wider range of uh, tools in the space. Thinking about also, you know, just it's not, you know, the the actual abilities to do that with a, certain devices now is very challenging. But I think moving forward, I think that's going to be there's going to be many capabilities around that, and I think there's a ton of power in this idea of adaptive audio. I mean, just from a simple idea, um, you know, imagine you have a, an app on your cell phone and it can immediately sense when it goes in your pocket, so it gets louder, or the EQ changes to where it cuts through kind of environmental sound or through your pocket. Um, so when it's out, it can actually be quieter. You can, you know, so these adaptive elements that um, will hopefully be more at play very soon will, will be super powerful moving forward. 
My name is Raphael, and you talked a lot about like organizations that have um, like a big sound design infrastructure or pretty big um, professional sound design teams. I was wondering if you had any advice on um, introducing like sound design into an organization that um, is not really like a sound design culture, um, like that is very open to it, but just doesn't have like the infrastructure. Yeah. I can jump in. I think that's why we exist as vendors, because um, I'm not certain that most companies, you know, know what it takes or know how to how to bring those folks into their matrix and into their design structure. Um, we're also, we also are used to running really quickly um, as vendors and really lean. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Something crazy is going on. Speaking of sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I, think it's a, I think it's a challenge. And yeah, someone turned that mic off. I, th I think it's a challenge, and I think it's very, very dependent on each company's culture and what they're willing to assume or not assume into their culture. Yeah, uh, just a quick, uh, quick one on that. Just a couple of anecdotes. Um, one, I create lots of docs and send them to lots of people all the time. So <laughs> I sort of saturate my channels at the bigger companies with audio information all the time. I send white papers, I create white papers. Um, I'm just sort of busy on that front in hopes that I will spark and get a signal because um, you know, I think Alad's right. Like we exist and we will continue to exist for a reason. But um, if a company is open to knowing more and handling sound better, we want to foster that as much as possible so that we just have more resources to do our job, on, whether on the technical side to the last question or on the uh, taking risk side to Alad's earlier point. Um, you know, we really want to sort of acclimate those companies and let them know what's possible and kind of, you know, spark their imagination. Thank you so much. Um, you shared a lot about some principles and frameworks around sound design. And something that I'm kind of curious about is what are some considerations that you make in your work around accessibility? Well, can we elaborate a little bit more for the crowd on what accessibility means to you? Um, I guess in terms of accessibility, like people of all abilities. The stumper. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, project specific um, and, and also playback system specific for people like that might have hearing loss or something like that, you're definitely taking, often taking into consideration those things, right? For people that might have a hearing loss of kind of what frequencies work better for them. You know, there tends to be a roll off on the high frequency end and the low frequency end. So yeah, we're thinking about kind of how we shape these tones in, in these types of environments and, and also adapting to generally like what's gonna cut through environmental noise for, for everyone. Um, another thing about accessibility is um, a recent project I worked on it, it touches a massive amount of people. It's a KQED who's uh, NPR affiliate for Northern California. And the listener group and base is a massive ba listener base. Um, so with that work, you know, we wanted to make it accessible to generally anybody and wanted to make that work um, something that anyone could appreciate, you know, um, and not super strong point of view on it. Um, so yeah, we're, I, I can definitely say certainly, you know, thinking about accessibility issues and stuff like that in these spaces for sure. There's also again the opportunity for a multi-sensorial uh, engagement, like haptics and sound, or you see, you know, when you see the strobe go off with the, with the, with the phone ring, uh, you know, for grandmas and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, um, so kind of related to it. Um, I will say that one of the points that I, I actually cut from my slide deck just because I didn't kind of have enough time to you know, keep talking your ear off, um, one of the big points that's important to me as a designer is program management. Um, and this kind of, again, speaks to some of the material design work that Connor's been doing. And it's about maintaining an ecosystem for all of the experiences on a particular platform and having a set of standards. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, like I said, it's kind of related, but, um, you know, if experiences aren't kind of regulated to some extent, there is no adherence to spec, 
um, you know, things play back too quietly, and people not, might not even realize there's sound because it's too low. Um, people might be wearing headphones, like kids might be wearing headphones, and you might have a, a mobile app that didn't adhere to a standard, and it comes flying in hot, and then you have the potential for hearing damage, and a, a child might not know that, that it's too loud for them. So um, program management, especially in, in the technology and software and hardware world where it's not quite as established as in film and broadcast, um, is crucially important because it's still kind of the wild, wild west, and only a few folks like Connor are sort of really digging in and trying to get that message out there. So that's a big note that, I, again, I would love to see the design, design community kind of run with. Um, to build on this, I had a similar question about accessibility, but thinking about of a continuum of ability. And we're getting more sophisticated tools on the visual side, so we know things like we have tools to gauge whether something is high enough contrast to be visible to a wide range of visual users. And we know we have rules that we've learned now around making sure that we don't communicate something by color only, reinforcing it with a visual change like an icon or something that can be seen that doesn't rely entirely on color. So I was curious whether you are starting to see projects, especially for consumer devices or things that you can touch, that where you think about this continuum of ability for sound, where it, I'm really glad you brought up haptics, because um, actually while I was waiting here, I got a call and I responded to it and there was no sound. <laughs> so I think um, in the same way that visual um, guidelines have been provided for designers around contrast and around color, we just have these rules and it's extremely helpful. I'm curious whether on the sound design side, especially for consumer products, are you starting to hear that as a consideration? Um, I think so. A lot of the, 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 the last part of products that I, or projects I worked on, work on with different companies, I often provide kind of audio guidelines that are similar to brand guidelines, but they also talk about, um, you know, they talk about the, the thinking process of what are we trying to communicate? Who are we trying to communicate to? Um, what are these kind of brand personas or attributes we're trying to express? But also it gets into that more engineering side of, um, you know, kind of in my presentation talking about low priority versus high priority, priority alerts and how we compose those based on how people listen in environments. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the last part of projects with me is, is um, essentially creating documents for companies that they can have. Um, and that they can continue to use, and that can inform, um, you know, the remainder of products they might have coming out, you know, shortly after as well. And if I want to be maverick about it, um, you know, I, I feel like with sound, a lot of times we don't know until we hear it, and it's trial and error and exploration, because ultimately we're trying to give a personality to the sound, and so how do you define that personality? Um, you know, it's going back to the adjectives. You're shaping, shaping and sculpting. And yeah, we can look at an oscilloscope and we can look at um, frequency response and we can look at the science, but it's ultimately we're creating a personality and almost a persona to these sounds when you think of these modern notifications from WhatsApp to Slack to Skype to, to all these products. And that's, so it's, it's really, sometimes it starts on the dartboard. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that, um you know, we use our ears um, professionally, right? So it's largely about intelligibility is sort of our number one mission. Like whether it's dialogue or whether it's um, sound effects or music, we want to really use the full frequency uh, spectrum and we want to really make things pop and punch. So part of it is, um, you know, mixing, just mixing thoughtfully. Um, and really using our ears and using our experience. Another piece, though, is uh, you know having a product that supports uh, what we imagine. So that has to do with having a sound team on early enough so that they can influence the speaker that's chosen. Um, uh, because realizing uh, that soundscape does have a lot of dependencies in the, the consumer product world, uh, on, both on the software and the hardware side. So that's kind of related. Cool. Yeah, I'll just add. Um, there are objective and subjective measurements that can be made. And if, uh, if you're referring to a specific project, I would definitely recommend engaging with a psychoacoustics expert. Um, hi, I'm Zilka. 
Um, thanks a lot for all the information. This is, I'm a huge Android ring phone fan, so what I usually do in a Neumann environment is like I go through all the ringtones and cannot decide for one. I chose the one you played today. Um, <laughs> Um, but I also have a slight hearing impairment. It's like not, I never got, went to a doctor, but I know that from my friends. And that's also annoying for them. For me, it was be, would be just like a super little step, uh, super helpful, because I'm not educated in what people hear better or not. So I don't know actually that higher frequencies is something I hear better. So it will help if you just put it in the name, like, you know, um, hearing impaired, call on, that's not a good name, but you know, get the point. That would be super great. Just a little thing. That's a great suggestion. There is a, there is a field um, of, so this is something that hopefully will become more prolific, but um, so in VR and AR and mixed reality, um, there's this notion of uh, HRTFs or head related transfer function has to do with the actual physical distance between our ears and the shape of our ears and how the reflections in a given environment are interpreted. And um, there has been talk about essentially creating custom profiles for people that are HRTF custom profiles. So essentially you would go in and you would have your HRTF profile uh, mapped and um, there would be something you'd be able to load onto some kind of you know, pair of headphones or an operating system. So I think, uh, I'm kind of hoping that you know that there's a little bit more signal. Folks like yourself are kind of you know pushing that forward, but there is definitely a field of science there, um, and it can create just a better experience even for a, a traditional listener because it uh, again it translates what's tr what's uh, a sound designer was trying to convey, um, kind of universally over all here listeners. Hey, my name is Suyash. I have two questions. One is regarding why aren't why don't we see more sound used in the apps? Because I I you know, in any game you play, every tap, every click, everything has a sound effect. But in apps, there is no sound, except for like, you know, Facebook or apps, like they put like notification sound, which is annoying. And, you know, they, everybody want to annoy you with notification, but they don't use sound like in other places I noticed. What's, where do you think sounds could be used in apps? And second question is, uh, I really uh, am fascinated by sonification. Any books or any resources to learn about uh, sonification? So I think, you know, it's, it's dependent for the app, you know, app question about why they don't add as much sound on apps as, as games. Um, you know, I think it's dependent on the app and like what the brand is trying to communicate ultimately, right? And um, Facebook, you said, for example, has kind of more, you know, touch sound, things like that, more just feedback, generally speaking. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, the demographic they're reaching is a bit younger, um, so they want to probably gamify the experience a bit more, whereas some other apps, you know, might be a bit more um, just pulled back from a design sense and more, like, uh, clean, right? So it's, I guess, every app is going to be different, right, on how much or how little sound it will use. So I think it's very specific to that particular company or that particular brand. Um, as far as books, um, Sonic Branding uh, is a great um, entry book into the field of audio branding. Um, it was written about 10 years ago, but that's, a, that's kind of a classic, um, classic book to read. Yeah, and I would just add that these companies are incredibly intentional. You know, so getting any sound into that app is, is a huge ladder of approvals. And um, yeah, so it's a miracle when a sound gets picked. Um, yeah, just one book is uh, Universal Sense. is a fantastic uh, book. It's, it's pretty deep, pretty heady, but all kinds of great stuff and very applicable. I wonder if you could identify some dangerous or unhealthy behaviors around sound that humans have and what you think the risk is. Yeah, music is too loud, man. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I have kids, I'm old, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, music is generally, genuinely too loud. So there is a topic that maybe some people have heard of. It's called the loudness war. Uh, it's genuine. It's a real thing. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field of study now. Um, and it has to do with generally how uh, records were made in the 90s primarily and the just continuous driving up of sound. 
Um, systems play it back too loud. Um, and, uh, and music also loses dynamics, um, and audio loses dynamics. The, loud it, the louder the music is presented on the whole, the less dynamic range it has, and the more it's getting squashed at the top, and therefore the less uh, information and the, 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 the less drama you can sort of author into sound. So there's a creative risk right off the bat. And of course, um, yeah, hearing is precious. Uh, and after being in this field for many years, playing in bands for many years, I can say that I, you know, I, I would definitely support a PSA for the kids. You know, preserve your, your hearing, turn it down. Um, but one of the cool things about you know things like electric cars and, and a lot of the things that Connor was talking about in his speech about you know kind of turning the world down a little bit is uh, you know UX sound design and the proliferation of sort of audio in our environment and devices you know becoming more uh, auditorily. Um, you know, uh, responsive is that we do now finally kind of have a chance to curate, and maybe you know V8s are going to go away because gas is expensive, and electric cars will come in, and so I'd like to think the world is getting quieter, but um, yeah, there are some risks currently. Yeah, and I'll I'll piggyback on that real quick and say that our, our urban ambient environment is too loud, yeah. uh, our BART trains are too loud, um, being a pedestrian next to an air brakes on a truck and squealing brakes on a truck goes above. Um, the safe level, you know, I'm that guy who holds his ears shut uh, when I'm on my bicycle and a truck goes by because I know it's going to affect my work if I don't. So, you know, these are important considerations, especially when you have kids and they're exposed to these ambient sounds. I think another space that has a lot of room for improvement and um, is, is uh, hospital spaces. You go into a hospital room and there's multiple devices that are constantly beeping at these people, which... Um, does drive stress and it drives these moments of, you know, depending on what level of stress, you know, it could be, it could just be an annoyance, but, you know, these people that are in hospitals are people that need to be in a relaxing environment, a place that they feel comfortable in. So I think there's a ton of improvement um, that can happen in our hospitals of, of kind of curating those spaces. Um, but as these guys mentioned, I think just like the ambient, you know, soundscapes that we see every day are generally very, very loud. Um, so... Yeah, there's many health risks, I think, ultimately. Um, have you designed a uh, physical object that moves? Um, so the simplest one could be the sound of a light switch, and the complex one could be the motor or drone or sound of the robot arms. And if you have, it would be great if you could share the experience, because I think I find it's super difficult. It, it's completely different from digital, but it is a part of the experience. Physical object sound? Yeah, so you know, a, a synthesizer is capable of designing any sound in our physical world. So a competent sound designer should be able to sit with a synthesizer and design any sound, from a trumpet to a piano to a light switch. Yeah, that, that I mean, Elad kind of nailed it. I mean, you can really recreate kind of any sound that is in the natural world pretty, um, you know, pretty well um, through synthesis. Um, and, you know, within UX, too, like, there's opportunities to do skeuomorphic types of design, um, which is incorporating potentially Foley into that as well, um, although there's been a bit move, a movement away from some of that skeuomorphic design, but, yeah. Yeah, um, I would just say that, uh, you know, this is the most fun thing we have to design, um, m movement. Uh, there's, a, there's an exponential way, amount of ways to express it. Uh, Schemorphic is a great example. And f for me, I, and again, you kind of hit on the head here. Schemorphic is like not cool and then very cool and then not cool. It, I mean, it swings. It's a, that is like, seriously, just throw it in the mix because it might be cool that day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Uh, and you, you might find the product teams really like it. So I would say just get crazy with things that move. Um, I mean, and listen to, um, you know, uh, film is just killer at this. Look at, look at uh, some of the best sound designers. Look at the sound designers at Skywalker and, and listen, to, listen to moving objects in, in Star Wars. And, and it's wild, like, a, you know, what a TIE fighter sounds like. It's a, you know, it sounds like an animal. Uh, so you can, you can kind of pull anything. As I would just say, just have a blast with it. <laughs> And just to add, uh, Hide, uh, there's a whole range of, or there's a discipline of sound design, uh, sound synthesis called physical modeling, which might be interesting to you, uh, which specifically tries to take in the physics of an object and how that would sound. Um, uh, what I was going to ask is, uh, you touched a little bit on like designing for AR, VR, and that's like spatialized audio, right? But like, have you ever designed? 
for something where it's like not necessarily like um, where it's like just sources in the physical world. Like you have a bunch of devices surround you know in your home that make noises. And how do you approach that design problem? Like designing a sound environment that you don't necessarily control. Yeah, that, that's really tricky. Um, I think, again, I'm going to pick on Connor's talk here a little bit, Connor Moore. Um, you, you got into this a little about not being able to control that soundscape. And I'd, I'd like to think that we're sort of on the precipice. So now that we have microphones as well as speakers on so many things, and we have intelligent OSs running on everything and cloud support for assets, um, there's absolutely no reason why we can't essentially be measuring the the environment. So our, our headphones currently do this, and our phones do this pretty well. They do uh, echo cancellation. They're always measuring the ambient environment, and they're always EQing your voice in, so that as you're speaking, if you're you know if you're on Bart and it's loud as heck, um, you know your voice is still coming through on that call in many cases. So there's a lot of work being done um, in that way. But in terms of um, yeah, all sort of the cacophony or trying to control the cacophony in a space. Um, yeah, I think that that's a tricky one. I don't know that we'll ever quite solve that because we can never, you know, make everybody buy all Google products or, or Apple products, so we don't know that we'll have control over that. Um, but maybe, again, so back to your work with, with, with material and project, uh, program management, you know, maybe we will start to develop a standard for especially like in-home uh, sound ecosystems, and I think that would be a great thing. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in that space. Um, yeah, kind of piggybacking on what Kevin was talking about, about, you know, we, we might not have that much control over this yet, but from a pure brand standpoint, you know, the brands themselves should be really considering what these, um, these multiple devices are sounding like and how can they potentially harmonize together. Um, I know it kind of beats around your question a little bit, but um, this is actually pretty new, I think, that companies are really thinking holistically because they're developing products faster. The technology is constantly advancing so quick. And I think companies are really seeing this opportunity to say, okay, wow, this is cool. We have an ecosystem of devices. Let's have them kind of speak the same language, you know, harmonize with one another, have similar instrumentation and have an overall kind of cohesive DNA that carries you through an experience and might even tell a story. Um, but similar to what Kevin said, you might have Amazon, Google products, and, and how will that um, work out in the future? Who knows? But I, I do think that idea of kind of a, you know, uh, uh, an actual like format of how that would play out in an in-home system would be really fascinating. How do you feel about UX design kind of prioritizing user control and giving the user the option to kind of mute or turn off sound? How do you navigate that sort of situation? Um, I think it's great. I think you should give personalization. Um, sound is something that's really subjective. Um, you know, we are from our, you know, our birth, we are around sound constantly, you know, with music, you, you form opinions about sound, I think, in ways that other mediums you don't, right? Everyone kind of has an opinion on what types of music they like, and that shifts over time. Um, so sound is just the same. And in the context of product, you know, I'm just very, very sensitive about, generally speaking, less is more. Um, uh, because people have very strong opinions and we have to be careful about how much we're bombarding them. So I think personalization in that, in that context is a great thing. I mean, at the end of the day, the user has to decide, you know, what they're going to play, when they're going to play it. And if they have that power, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I will just quickly say a little devil's advocate on that. Uh, <laughs> um, I agree, and, and I think that there's a, an accessibility perspective on that that's like non-negotiable. Um, and I think that there is curation is great, subjectivity is, is a thing, um, but it really is medium specific. So I think in some cases uh, this is this is kind of like this this in itself is subject kind of to opinion, but um, you know like. If you're someone that likes to go to a restaurant and get what the chef makes, or if you like to pick from many, many pages from a diner, uh, I tend to be more of like, I want to taste what the chef makes. It's just, that's just my feeling. Uh, so, you know, I do want to, I think that there should be experiences out there, even in UX experiences, um, that you get how, you get what's made. You get how it's built. You hear it how it's made. Uh, so, again, just playing devil's advocate. I think there's room for both. Uh, but, yeah. 
Okay, great. That's all the time we have. So, um, Kai, did you want to say anything to wrap yeah, things up? Yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, it was really wonderful to have you. I, I learned so many new terms tonight that um, I'm going to go look up and learn more about. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to thank you all for joining us. And thank you all for joining us. Join us for n next month for Design is Curious. So have a wonderful evening. And thank you very much. Thank you.